Hello and welcome to another in our series of Deeper Insight videos where we bring together members of the Westpac economics and strategy teams to discuss macroeconomic developments and markets that could impact our region. My name's Robert Rennie and I'm joined today by senior economist and commodity expert Just, Justin Smirk. So welcome Justin and I'm really looking forward to our conversation on commodities and super cycles. So it doesn't really matter whether you watch widely traded commodity markets like crude oil or copper or more narrowly traded ones like iron ore, we've seen some breathtaking gains across pretty much all of the commodity complex through the fourth quarter of last year and first quarter of this year. Copper jumped 35% over that six month period Crude oil rose by circa 47-48% and iron ore by between 55 and 60%. I was listening to a podcast over the weekend that noted that US lumber prices were up by 130% over that Q4, Q1 period and are up 25% so far this quarter. And not surprisingly, those gains across the, com the commodity complex have prompted talk that we're in a new commodity super cycle. Now, personally, I'm not really a believer in this being another commodity super cycle along the lines of the emergence of China through the last decade. Rather, I tend to see idiosyncratic short-term supply and demand shocks as key drivers of commodity prices in each of those markets. I remember publishing, uh, publishing a video uh, back in December when I noticed uh, the incredible records that were being broken in China in terms of steel production and the impact that this was having on iron ore prices. Well, that story has continued through this year so far. In fact, seasonally adjusted March Chinese steel production came in at a fresh record high of 95 and a half million tons, much to my surprise on Friday last week, given headlines of steel restrictions in uh, March. Indeed, in 11 of the last 12 months on a seasonally adjusted basis, we've had sequential records in Chinese steel production and this incredible run of record steel production has lifted Chinese iron ore imports back up to long-term trend, which has been running at circa 5 million tons per year for the last 15 years. That's a very sharp and very positive demand shock. In the face of this explosion in demand for iron ore, we've seen a series of one-off weather events and other significant issues that have essentially left exports out of combined Australia and Brazil essentially flat for the last three or, uh, three or so years. So I can see why this massive positive demand and mild negative supply shock has seen the iron ore prices double from sub $90 a year ago to circa $177 in recent days, just below those peaks seen at the peak of the last commodity super cycle in 2011 when iron ore traded above 180. But Justin, less about me and how I'm thinking about what's driving commodity markets at the moment. What are you thinking uh, in terms of commodity super cycles and the commodities that you're forecasting? I guess the thing that's keen to me, Rob, is breaking it down into the, sort of those long-term and short-term effects. Um, you're right, we're in a very strong sweet spot right here right now, and we're talking about a global recovery, not just what's going on in China now, but as you pointed out, lumber prices in the US is pointing yes. out what's going on in the US as well with a strong recovery there. We've got liquidity being flooded into the system, Correct. and we've got global trade now recovering back to more normal levels. All of it points towards being a super sweet spot for commodity prices right now and why they can get a good push. Now, it's very comfortable to talk about those sort of issues around supply and demand, much more conservative mining companies out there. Um, we've got a, an investment profile that is softer. We've got a ongoing constraints around supply, reasonably robust demand, all suggesting commodity prices can remain higher for longer. But is it a new emergence of a billion, billion people entering the market, soaking up supply, com mining companies having no idea what's going on and being lagging behind? No, it's not. The s when you people talk about a super cycle, they're talking about multi years, decades running long, where there's an imbalance between supply and demand. What we're talking about here is a tighter market, but one where everything at the moment is pointing in one direction and pointing up. And that suggests we're going to have higher prices for longer and even in the short run, hitting new highs. Now it's interesting that you make that point. I remember listening to the video that um, Elliot Clark and Richard Franulovich did fairly recently talking about the Build Back Better mm -hmm. infrastructure program in the US. And I guess thinking about recent developments um, there, I mean, is there a possibility that that very potent combination of Biden's infrastructure plan, remembering that China has this very ag aggressive peak carbon uh, by 2030 and zero carbon by 2060, um, we've got the um, uh, European recovery f uh, plan uh, uh, very much focused on uh, environmental sustainability as well. 
Is there a risk that it's not so much a commodity super cycle as an infrastructure or build back better um, super cycle that, that really drives the kind of mar mar markets that will be in uh, very heavy demand? So I'm thinking copper, nickel, aluminium, steel, um, maybe even cement as well. Is there a possibility that that's really the driver over the next couple of years? Well, that's going to be an important part of, the on of why commodity prices can remain higher for longer, because we're talking about new demand situations coming through, yes. new, po new points. Um, what we also can note in the backdrop of all this is, um, while we spend a lot of time talking about China, is global steel production now, outside of China, yes. is now back above where it was pre-COVID. Yes. So you've seen a strong global recovery coming through as well, which has been adding to it. But that build back better, green, that is part of all the ongoing scenarios of why you can get um, higher prices for longer. Mm. But we need to be really careful about how we think various commodities. Um, there's certain supply situations which are changing. You talk about China and the desire to go towards, gr go towards lower carbon emissions. That points towards using electric arc furnaces, which uses more scrap steel. Mm. The, ma the market's maturing yes. in China, you have more supply of scrap. Again, the same with copper. You look at a situation where, yes, there's tight supply situations and some imbalances, but every time we've been here before, we see new supplies of secondhand scrap copper coming to the market. Yes. They find it wherever. And we find increasing uses of alternatives like aluminium. Yeah. So while we can use this as all as a framework for talking about why commodity prices can remain higher for longer, it does not mean they only go in one direction. It means they can stay higher, but we get these bubbles of short-term supply shocks and yeah. demand shocks, which produce rallies up. Then we get um, some corrections coming through and then moving back up again. So it's more about talking about this area of volatile prices at high levels yep. rather than one way, one way straight. What about the supply side um, as well? Um, I mean, I talked before the idea that we've, we're seeing a very strong, consistent, steady mm -hmm. trend in terms of Chinese demand for iron ore. But the last three or four years, essentially, supply out of Australia and Brazil has mm -hmm. essentially been Almost flat. Sideways. I could look at the same for copper. Um, copper mining production over the last three or four years has essentially been flat. There's a lot of noise in the data. Yes. And the fourth quarter of last year, we saw a reasonable pickup, but we're still really talking about 1% mm -hmm. on a three month year year basis. So what's it gonna take to incentivize mining companies to get out there to invest more in um, increased copper, um, increased aluminium production, given the potential for that demand over coming years? It's the ongoing battle between the degree of risk involved with a multi-year, multi-decade investment into a large project yeah. versus the short-run benefits. Um, this transition period we're facing going towards being a, being a bit greener and better future, we're not talking decades here. This is a transition that we wants to be completed within a decade. Yes. So it's a much more shorter extreme shock. And that's why we're in it now. That's why we're experiencing these prices. Yeah. Um, and that's why mining companies are going to be conservative, which is why we have to keep on thinking about there being upside risk to prices while not getting too carried away with an idea that this is just going to be 10, 15 years of ongoing high prices that can just last because you've got this new demand constantly being recreated the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. We're more sort of in a sort of, this, we're in that structural change point right here, right now, which is giving us all the signs going in one direction, which is why prices keep on being pushed higher. Yeah, and obviously the implications of that, um, uh, that, you, that point that you're making really, that mining companies are probably more focused on cutting costs than in getting out there and investing. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly a positive uh, outlook from a credit and from an equity point of view. It is, but it also is a very real signal too in the most recent commodity prices. Those who are watching the market would have noticed nickel prices have actually corrected. They corrected because nickel prices were being driven by this enthusiasm for, bat for battery, uh, using nickel and batteries. Yep. And lo and behold, they started developing new technology which they can use, laterites, that sort of gravelly stuff they get from Indonesia, which contains some nickel. Yep. They can now convert that into nickel that can be used in battery batteries. Grade. Yep. Battery grade. Yep. So we've got to be very careful about all these situations with how, with how commodities are evolving. And while we can talk about, you know, even I, I'm comfortable with the idea that a decade from now, commodity prices will be higher than they were yep pre the Chinese mining boom, we're talking, still talking about good profits in the mining sector, good rates of return. Yeah. Um, just not talking about a one-way bet the yeah. whole time. That's a really good point, Justin. All right, let's bring it back to Australia if we can. Um, looking at the importance of iron ore, uh, and in particular iron ore prices to the overall uh, value of goods and uh, goods exports from Australia. 
not putting any pressure on you, but given the importance that prices have really played in um, uh, recent years, what are you forecasting through this year and next year and any other thoughts on the outlook for resources in Australia? So while there's some upturn momentum for iron ore prices in the near term, by the end of the year we expect a little bit of a supply and demand rebalance to come through, so talking about $150 a tonne. And then the ongoing recovery coming through from the, particularly the Brazilian supply and the shift towards scrap, taking it down towards $80 a tonne towards the end of 23. I also should mention that we're a little bit more constructive around coal prices. At the moment, Australian coal prices are being hit really hard by the Chinese, by the Chinese trade, barrier, trade um, bans. Um, we expect either the trade bans to be lifted slightly or the alternative markets to continue to grow for the Australian supply. So we see for the next 12 months at least some upside risk for coal prices while we may be seeing, talking about weaker iron ore prices. Many thanks, Justin. Some really good points there. So thank you again for your time. Well, that concludes today's Deeper Insight videos. And we have talked at length about uh, commodities and super cycles. And I think if there's one key takeaway from my point of view, it's the idea that we, we could see commodity prices higher for longer. And certainly in the very short term, those commodities that are really focused on infrastructure, we could see some further upside risks over the, uh, the coming year. Thank you, and we'll talk again soon.